What about today? Where is Reconstruction historiography nowadays? Well, as I said, the scholarship of the 70s and 80s and into the 90s was written in the aftermath of the civil rights era. In the aftermath of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, uh, it's not surprising, perhaps, that a lot of historians lately have turned attention again to violence and terrorism in Reconstruction. Here is a homegrown example of violent terrorism in American history. Um, a number of recent books on Reconstruction, including some aimed at a broader audience outside the academy, have infused the subject with drama by focusing on violent confrontation. So, for example, one of the best is by uh, our colleague here, Nicholas Lehman, uh, who was the dean of the law school for several years until uh, relinquishing that post recently. Uh, his book, Redemption, on the violent overthrow of Reconstruction in Mississippi, puts violence at the center of terrorism, at the center of that period. Um, uh, there were two works came out a few years ago about the Colfax massacre. We'll talk about that, the bloodiest single day of violent terrorism in Louisiana, Colfax, Louisiana, 1873, during Reconstruction. Um, and there's a lot more literature on this, on how the government did or didn't succeed in combating terrorism. Obviously, that's on people's minds after uh, 2001. Um, secondly, Reconstruction historiography lately like, ha has become more national. In other words, the focus of most writing was previously on the South. I mean, that's where Reconstruction took place. That's where, but the whole nation was being reconstructed in some way after the Civil War. Um, the West in this period has generated a lot of interest lately. Uh, this is the period uh, of uh, not only fighting in the South, but the Indian Wars, the subjugation of the Plains Indians, the wars against the Comanche and Apache, particularly uh, in the Reconstruction period. Uh, huge chunks of the West were controlled by Native Americans before the Civil War, but the Civil War and Reconstruction, among many other things, consolidates uh, national control over that area. In that sense, Reconstruction is seen as a continuation of the Civil War's impulse toward national consolidation. We talked about that, the nationalization of things. Reconstruction continues that in trying to bring the South in in a new way, trying to bring the West in, the expansion of, uh, of national power in the West. In addition, in the last 10 years or so, as the language of empire entered uh, American political discourse with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, scholars began to look at, again, the enhancement of the power of the national state and its imperial, uh, an imperial drive during Reconstruction. Um, even as the struggle between Andrew Johnson and Congress reached its climax, the United States acquired Alaska which was one part of an imperial agenda long advocated by Seward, still Secretary of State. Under President Grant in Reconstruction, the U.S. tried to annex the Dominican Republic. Didn't work, but this business of looking for possessions outside of the continental United States, well, I guess Alaska's in the continent, but not the proximity of the continental United States. Um, begins in Reconstruction, according to this argument, and will, act, will reach its fruition later in the Spanish-American War. Um, at the same time, scholars showed, and I think this is interesting work, um, that the failure of Reconstruction became an international ideology, not just one within the United States. The notion that the failure of Reconstruction showed the incapacity of non-white peoples for self-government a couple of Australian scholars, um, Lake and Reynolds, wrote a really interesting book a few years ago called Drawing the Color, uh, draw, I'm sorry, Drawing the Global Color Line. This is an example of what they call the internationalization or globalization or whatever you want to call it of U.S. history, trying to see how U.S. history kind of fits into a broader international framework. Well, what they argue is that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, that was a time of a kind of global sense of fraternity among self-described Anglo-Saxon nations, which included 
the United States, South Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. All of these countries studied and adapted each other's um, racial policies. U.S. segregation influenced apartheid in South Africa. Exclusion of Chinese in one country was followed by exclusion of Chinese in another country. The Bible of these movements, according to them, was the work, The American Commonwealth, by the British writer James Bryce, who came to the United States and published this book in 1888, after Reconstruction's over. The American Commonwealth is mostly about political processes in America, but part of it is about Reconstruction as a time of corruption, misgovernment, caused by the enfranchisement of the former slaves. Bryce proved, in quotes, that blacks and Chinese and aboriginal people were in, unfit to be citizens. And his book and his writings on Reconstruction were cited in the parliament in uh, Australia, in South Africa. The, the failure of Reconstruction became, as they say, the key history lesson in the effort to create white men's, or what they called white Australia, the white Australian policy, or the apartheid policy in South Africa. Um, Reconstruction proved the impossibility of multiracial democracy. If, you ever used, if anyone ever said, well, why shouldn't we give some of these non-whites the right to vote, the horrors of Reconstruction would be pulled up in order to refute that. So as Du Bois pointed out in his book, Black Reconstruction, what Du Bois argued was Reconstruction was fundamentally a, an episode in the history of democracy. An episode in the history of democracy. For a moment, there was real democracy in the United States. Then it was destroyed. And that had reverberations uh, across the globe. So another trend then right now is this expansion of Reconstruction out of the South to the West and even beyond the borders of the United States. On the other hand, since historians are always doing many different things, there's a lot of local work going on stressing the complexities of what happened after the Civil War in the South, different places undergoing different kinds of local Reconstruction, and probably the most important work is about gender and Reconstruction, a subject which had not gotten very much attention until relatively recently, and how the experience of women, both black and white, differed in significant ways from that of men. That emancipation was experienced differently by black women. We will talk about this too. I'm just laying out ideas to bear in mind. Um, emancipation looms large, but the local variations and differences within, of how different kinds of people in different regions experience it um, is now a major subject of um, investigation. But at the same time, I think, recent histories of Reconstruction tend to, like the post-revisionists, give as much emphasis to the disappointments of freedom uh, as to the uh, accomplishments. Or they emphasize goals other than freedom, such as equality or fraternity, and emphasize how Reconstruction did not come close to achieving those things. Where once the abolition of slavery was seen as the watershed of African American life, and that, that idea is epitomized in probably the most influential textbook of African American history ever written by John Hope Franklin, From Slavery to Freedom. You see, the title just tells you the story. That's the African American story, From Slavery to Freedom, with, of course, the end of slavery being the pivot. But today, historians have, got, have been emphasizing the inadequacy of the freedom brought about by the Civil War and the continued subordination of African Americans long after the Civil War had ended. Uh, Stephen Kantrowitz, a scholar at uh, Wisconsin, wrote a book a couple of years ago called More Than Freedom. More Than Freedom. People need more than freedom. Don't just celebrate emancipation. And in fact, his section on the Reconstruction era is called the disappointments of citizenship. It's a disappointment just gaining political and civil rights. So that's, that tendency is still out there to say the real problem 
Reconstruction was a tragic era, not because, as Bauer said, it unleashed a bunch of savage people to run amok in the South, but because it didn't achieve what it might have or should have and left that to future generations. Um, and finally, there's an expansion of Reconstruction, you might say chronologically, just as I've said before, we've had, everything is long nowadays to historians, so we now have a long Reconstruction. Um, down to the turn of the century, like the long emancipation or the long civil rights movement. And important works have looked at politics in the South and black politics in the South after the end of Reconstruction. In other words, they make the very important point, not everything ended in 1877, when we normally date the end of Reconstruction. So you have to really go all the way down to the imposition of a new racial system in the South, which doesn't really come about until around 1900, to see the end of this long Reconstruction. And we will talk about that a, a little bit later.